Welcome back to the Red Dice Diaries RPG Podcast with John and Hannah. Hi. And today we're going to be talking about the Zygon. Okay, love, so I can see you've got the AD&D First Edition Monster Manual 2 there. That was a bit of a mouthful. So, what does it say about the Zygon? Well, what it mostly says is, I wonder how John picks these things when he puts them in that Twitter poll. Is it completely random? Well, in this case, it was basically because it's the only vaguely interesting monster that starts with a Z. And it is also the last monster in the Monster Manual, too. <laughs> so. so you're not actively picking out the mushroom creatures? No, 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 not, not actively. Although I've got to admit, there is a certain there is a certain link between like OSR stuff and like fungi. There's loads of books right. about mushrooms and that. Which load this up to YouTube? You need to put a mushroom creatures playlist on your channel. Well, I would do, but most of this stuff's not really on YouTube at the minute. So, but yeah, I'm sure we can like do some curated list of like fungal foes or something like that. <laughs> But, I mean, if you just look over there to your left, you'll see my Fungi of the Far Realms book. It's uh, sat proudly on my shelf with all its lovely watercolour illustrations of various mushrooms. Middlelands has got a mushroom table in it. Um, be Behind the Walls, the adventure that I did had some mushroom tables in it. <laughs> Let's face it, us OSR folks, we love them shrooms. That's all I'm saying. So, Zygons. Rare creature, arm class 8, moves one inch per turn or at the speed of its host hit dice depend on the host treasure type depends on the host number of attacks depends on the host bit of a theme here i'll skip on i'm so i'm starting to get the feeling that a lot of this um, thing depends on the host so zygons are an individual fungi uh that consists of short thin stem with an ovoid cap you look at them, they look a bit like those honey mushrooms that yeah. we ate that time yeah. when we did that survival camp. One or two dozen growths joined by a rhizome structure form a singular communal creature. So the rhizomes are like the rootlets on there and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Which is the zygon. Okay. So the actual mushroom looking things, they're sort of like fingers, whereas the, the rhizome is the brain. Okay, cool. So, yeah, they can grow in the earth, but they prefer to grow on living flesh. Of course they do, it's a D&D monster. Uh-huh. The infestation controls the host creature by brain and nerve con- connections and leads to the death of the host creature in one to eight weeks, depending on the size and constitution of the host creature. Okay. Uh, it stays there until it's eaten the whole of the dead body, and then it looks for a new host. Typically... Infestation starts on the head, neck, or spinal cord. That makes sense, nearest to the brain, you know. Typical host creatures are uh, ants, rats, <coughs> oscips, whatever an oscip is. Oscips, they're like um, giant tooth, like six to eight legged rats. Right, so vermin and occasionally small humanoids. Yeah. Uh, whenever a colony comes into contact with any creature, there's a one to six chance that a broken cap will be producing the pale blue milk that sticks to the creature. And if it gets on something's flesh, then it starts to turn them effectively. Okay. Uh, it notes that that substance is very sticky and can be used to glue materials together for two to five days and then the glue dissolves. Uh, quite possibly you could use that for something, making something that needs to disintegrate within. Yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure whether having some funky glue would sort of outweigh the dangers of being taken over by a parasitic fungus, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, if you really need glue that badly... Um. Yeah, and it's super duper insta sticky, so it says it can stick weapons to targets and creatures to creatures. See, again, that sounds like another sort of like gotcha, like trap monster moment there, where you're like, oh, I'm mm-hmm. going to swing my broadsword and hit it. And the rat's like, oh, oh, oh your broadsword's now stuck to it. What are you going to do without your broadsword? Mm hmm. And then the bit that I thought was kind of uh, could be useful again. Zygons have fungoid intelligence, which is totally alien to humans. Yeah. No mind-affecting magic. 
uh, beguiling, charming, dominating, holding, hypnotising, etc. will affect them. Now, it struck me that if you're up against an enemy who can do all of those things Mm -hmm. and your group is vulnerable to it, you might want to chuff down some Zygon potion and then go get some cure disease after you've beat your enemy. So you can use cure disease to like stop mm-hmm. it once you've been affected by it. But it really depends on the Zygon, like how quickly it takes you over. Uh, yeah, because I mean... This sort of seems to imply that it's a couple of days. Yeah, because like you're saying, if you, um, if you... If it's going to take a few days and, and you're like, oh, we've got Clarit, we've got removed disease, yeah, you can bang some of them spores down, you get the, the Brucey bonus to, mm-hmm. to resist uh, mind control and whatever, fight your enemy, get cure disease. However, if for like the second you chuff the spores down, you're going to be like, all hell are fungal overlords, then it's not quite so good. It also doesn't give you any clues as to what the Zygons' agendas or anything are it just says it's totally alien to humans and that it's going to last one to eight weeks and then it's going to want another host it doesn't even seem to suggest it plans ahead to look for another host i mean to be honest i'd guess that probably as like a fungus slash like parasite its main aim is just to like spread and proliferate itself Mm -hmm. so it sort of takes someone over it like effectively like digests them while they're under its control then when that body falls to pieces the body drops where it is mushrooms are still on it it waits for another body to come along rinse and repeat until the whole world's covered in mushroomy goodness (laughs) but yeah we were talking earlier and um i was saying that it reminded me of um invasion of the body snatchers and obviously it's not an exact fit you know with these monsters but um there's the scene in that where and i'm talking about i think the donald sutherland version where they find the sort of partially transformed like pod person and mm-hmm. it's got all the fibrous growths over it mm-hmm. and when they when they smash it in there's all like the gunge comes out of the slime rather than blood and it's not fully formed mm-hmm. now obviously that's not an exact match for the zygon because it takes over an existing body it made me think more of what's that comedy movie with um nathan fillion I think you're talking about Slither, where they have, like, the worms that, like, infest people and there's that guy who gets taken over by them. Yeah, Um, because that's just, like, entirely about his brain falling apart while this thing slowly eats him from the inside out. And you never really find out what it was about. It's all about the dude who's being destroyed by it. Yeah, I mean, again, I think it comes back to, as you were saying earlier, how quickly this thing takes you over. Mm-hmm. Because obviously the real sort of horror of like being infected by something like this would be that loss of self-control, that slowly, like you say, your mind sort of disintegrating and you becoming something else. But I think that also depends very much on your player group and how you're playing the game. Yeah. Like, if you're effectively playing... Uh, players versus monsters for XP points group of 10 year olds then what, what it's going to be way to play doing there it's going to be an I, instant I'm kidding thing folks I'm kidding I'm kidding because yeah it is quite an upsetting thing so you go instant right your character's a bad guy now you get to do bad guy stuff for a bit yeah and it's still fun for the 10 year old whereas if you're running a grown up game then it's very much down to your players how much sort of horror you want to put into that. Yeah, and I think one of the things we see, certainly with a lot of these earlier D&D monsters, and I've said this a number of times in other episodes and on other media, is I think sort of in early D&D, the sort of the walls between the different genres were a lot less sort of firmly built and clearly mm-hmm. defined. So you see, That's like, not a bad thing. Oh no, no, I, I love it. I mean, you see bits <laughs> of like science fiction creeping in, bits of swords and sorcery. It's a bit of original D and is a bit of a grab bag where the mm-hmm. authors took all the stuff they like and they crammed it into like the one thing. Mm-hmm. So you do get a lot of these monsters where there's like elements of horror and stuff like that coming in. But obviously, as Hannah was rightly saying. It's down to you as the GM to make that choice of like how much of your player is going to dig that horror vibe. If all your players are like, yeah, we love some of that horror, that body horror element, dive right, right into it. You know, have them get infected. You can delve into all the ramifications of it. 
if they just want to like go in and like beat up a monster, then it's probably going to be like a quick sort of like, oh, you've been infected by this disease. Maybe we've got to go on a quest to get a cure or something like that. So you can play it sort of both ways. And I always find that with a lot of these things, I think the whole like, oh, wait, you just get a cleric to cast remove disease on you. It is a bit of a, a poor cop out, to be honest. And I mean, I can see why it's done. It's easy. You don't really have to think about it. And I know you need remove disease as a certain level, but unless you're running a low magic game where that's not available, like remove disease isn't difficult to come across. I think there's also this element of you've got to know that it's a problem. Yes, of course. In order to be able to know what to do about it. Because the barbarians start sprouting mushrooms. Yeah. Maybe nobody even questions it because it's a barbarian. Maybe the druid starts sprouting mushrooms. Yep. And he thinks it's a great blessing from the gods. And then the bard remembers some story about some guy who had mushrooms growing out of the back of his neck and how within a couple of weeks the whole village was taken over and nobody goes there now. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think of um, the the moss dwarves from Gavin Norman's Dolmenwood, who were like this species of like forest-dwelling dwarves. And they sort of have like symbiotic fungi and mosses and stuff that live on them, hence mm-hmm. the name. And like, as a character, you get like a random like sort of descriptor and sort of like fungal sort of deal going on. And I think that's quite cool. And it makes me wonder, you know, obviously the default of these is this creature slowly digests you until you're all consumed. Your body falls over. The mushrooms carry on living in your body, maybe in a dormant state or whatever. Wait till someone else brushes against it. <laughs> Out go the spores, rinse and repeat. But Mm -hmm. it does make me wonder, you know, like, given all the fantastical powers that characters tend to have, in any version of D&D you care to name, is is there a way to find maybe where you could, like, enter some sort of more symbiotic rather than a parasitic relationship with it? I mean, let's say you're a druid or something who can talk to plants. I know fungi aren't specifically plants, but for for this purpose, let's say you can talk to them. I mean, I know in some versions of D&D there are specifically, like, druid mm-hmm. types that deal with fungi maybe if you can like talk to this creature i know it's not got mad intelligence but and it's supposed to be all alien and its motives are misunderstood but although its motives don't seem that difficult to understand mm-hmm. to be honest but maybe you can work out some sort of deal with it because as you say if you could you could work out a deal where the cost wasn't so egregious that you, it was sort of like beyond the pale then having that infestation of that fungus so long as it's not going to kill you might not be a bad thing, or well, it does normally kill you. Yeah, but like I say, weeks, if you can, but if you can avoid that, because that bit, you're fighting it. Yeah, or what if you? I know I've seen this doesn't tend to be for players, but what if you're like undead? Because it says it can survive on bones. What if you're undead? What if you're a lich? Because having like this fungus like infesting your body, it's not going to kill you, is it? Would it be able to take over your mind? I don't know because obviously technically it's magic. But if you're a lich, obviously your brain isn't working in the way a living person's mm-hmm. brain would be working. So if you're a lich and you're like, oh, this thing's slowly feasting on like, my rotting body, which I don't care about anyway because I'm a lich. However, having it getting juiced up on a load of like these spores may give me some benefits. Now, I know as a lich, you wouldn't really need the immunity to mind effects and whatever. But it's an interesting thing to see if you could like find a slightly different way of including this creature by just sort of pairing it with something else. It does actually mention living bodies. Ah, right. So I didn't read that bit. <laughs> living flesh. But the other thing it made me think of was the zombie ant fungus. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which is called cordyceps. cordyceps. Yes, the cordyceps fungus, yeah. Cordyceps. And I didn't know that it could infect other creatures until I was looking stuff up for this. Mm-hmm. And there's some really creepy pictures of, like, spiders that are infected with this stuff. Apparently there's a big thing at the minute with um, crazy, what do they call it, alternative medicine chicanery, where they're selling, like, a type of caterpillar that's been infected with this stuff. All right. Like, gooper selling products made of it. That tells you how good it is. Um if you, if you can't, in case you're not picking this up, um, I know it's subtle, but in case you're not picking this up, viewers, the sarcasm is real. Yeah. Um, 
I was just going to say it, it reminded me you mentioned in that of that um, film The Hallow we watched you know that Irish um, film board film where it's all about like the, the guy who's a tree surgeon who moves his family to the forest and there's the fae living in the forest but they're actually just people who've been like taken over by like a variant of this like cordyceps fungus mm-hmm. and there's the point where later on he gets infected mm-hmm. and you sort of see things from his point of view as like his vision starts changing and it's influencing his mind and obviously you have the last bit where he's sort of he's trying to hold on to enough of himself to like help his wife recover their son, like the baby son who's been taken by the Fae in inverted commas. Mm-hmm. And then like at the end he sort of finally like sacrifices himself because he recognises eventually he's gonna like devolve and become like them. So again we're coming back to this like how quick does it alter you? How quickly would you mm-hmm. lose your humanity sort of thing, which I think would be a great thing to have in a horror game, definitely. Although like you say, it might not be such a good thing if you're a normal sort of like rollicking D and D dungeon <laughs> crawl game. Yeah, it got me thinking about sort of cults as well. Okay. Um, different ways that people would react to this sort of thing if it was a natural phenomena going mm. on and infecting humans. That there aren't any known types of it that do infect humans, but there's been a couple of things that might be close. Apparently. Just enough to be scary. Yeah. Um, well, if you ever need to find a scary place, you just got to look at the real world. So, the first sort of thing that came into my head was, oh yeah, some cult that thinks it's like amazing to be infected by this thing. We are the chosen ones. Yeah. Um, oh, in which case, the Lord has returned. You'd have to make it quite a low level of um, infection rate yeah, and you'd have to make it a very slow process for that to sort of be sustainable otherwise you could have it be the like the curse as far as these people are concerned and people that are affected by it uh, shunned and whatever burned at the stake when they're found and their families destroyed and driven out of the village or whatever and then you wouldn't have to give it a slow infection rate well, or any of that I think an interesting potential thing is obviously we obviously it doesn't go into that much depth in this in um, the monster manual but it says that it's the spores getting on you that infect you right mm-hmm. then obviously the spores multiply throughout your body etc etc so presumably if you like took a massive guff of like hundreds of spores mm-hmm. as opposed to someone who maybe got like two or three on them mm-hmm. your infection would already be like far further along so perhaps if you get like a massive like blast of these spores maybe it takes you over really quickly as described in the book but what if like your cult or whatever maybe they just put one spore on you maybe they found a way to dilute the spores or they put it in some sort of solution that slows it down something else though what if this is something that's intentionally given to people who are ill, disabled, whatever else you want to have, like, part of your society, where they say, oh, these people are in pain, so we're going to give them this blessing. Oof. Yeah, that could be a real, real dark story, but... Again, things like that yeah, have happened ch- all throughout ch- ch- history. Show your players for you run that lab. <laughs> but um, yeah, you're right. Horrible, horrible things have been done under the guise of doing mm-hmm. good things all throughout history. You can't argue with that. But similarly, it could also be something that is considered a blessing for people that are dying to be able to go and take this slight like, magic brew, and you get eight weeks where you've got no pain, and then you go back into nature. Yeah. I could see how loads of people would take a really positive view of that. Yeah. If they were knew that they'd not got more than eight weeks anyway, well, why be in pain for those eight yeah, weeks? Yeah, I mean, maybe, and we're just spitballing here to give you guys some ideas, take it or mm-hmm. not as you see fit. What if, to use a stereotype, what if you've got like a society of elves or all like down with the woodlands and stuff like that? And maybe, because we know elves don't tend to age in the same way as other sort of races, there's obviously the Tolkien esque thing of like they go on the grey ships to to lands across the sea when they get to when their time has reached what if when their time is reached or they're weary of the world or whatever and they're just tired of it and they want to go on to whatever is after this life they bang some of these um, spores in them 
Mm -hmm. they then go on like you say they rejoin nature they become part of the cycle again it could be seen as like a religious thing for them and maybe you know like as the sort of spores are influencing your brain as with the film the hollow maybe the weird things it makes you see the babbling of the people who've been infected maybe that's seen as prophecy maybe it's seen as visions from the green or whatever that there's a lot of stuff you could do with it. I tell you what, it also makes me think. You know, you were saying like the rhizome growth, so like the brain, basically. Mm-hmm. So if there's like a big patch of this fungus, it's got a bigger brain, right? Mm-hmm. So as well as like meaning that like a bigger patch will, may theoretically be smarter, although still very alien. When someone gets infected, are they still part of that brain? Well, this is completely left up to you as a GM. Yeah. from how it's worded in the book. And I think, yeah, that's something else you would have to consider. Does each person that's infected become their own creature, effectively? Or are they all part of one greater creature? And if so, you know, obviously they've either got their own agendas or they've all got one agenda. And either of those could be really interesting for a story. Yeah. So there we go. Hopefully, we're giving you some ideas for how to use the humble Zygon in your games. If you've enjoyed this episode, or maybe you want to chat to us about something, perhaps suggest future ideas for episodes, then you can get in touch with us a number of different ways. You can leave us a voicemail message using the SpeakPipe website, there's a link in the description. Or you can leave us a message on our old Anchor account. Again, link in the description. Or finally, you can send us an email to rddrpgpodcast at gmail.com. Until we speak to you next time, take care, stay safe, and whatever you're playing, have fun. Bye.